Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second lecture of the week, uh, Drug Use in the Brain 2, so our second unit uh, on the brain and how drugs affect the brain. Uh, so again, for these next couple of lectures, uh, we're looking at drugs and how they affect the brain. Uh, and, and we're going to look at the brain at its smallest scale first. And of course, we haven't even really mentioned drugs this week so far. Uh, that's going to be more covered in next week. So today we'll just talk about uh, normal brain function. Uh, and then we'll talk about how drugs affect normal brain function. Uh, so we're going to start with the smallest scale of neurons, individual brain cells. And we talked about that last time. Uh, today we'll talk more about synapses, so the connections between neurons. So moving up from a single neuron to two neurons, or groups of neurons. Uh, and then next time we'll talk about the brain as a whole and, and cover techniques on how we measure brain activity, for example. Uh, so in this session in particular, what we're going to do uh, is talk about how neurons connect to one another structurally. Uh, and also learn how signals are transmitted from one neuron to another. So that's a chemical process. We'll look at the structure first, then the chemistry. Uh, and then we'll learn about the individual chemicals that are used to transmit information from one neuron to another. And those are called neurotransmitters. You've probably heard of many of them. So again, we're talking about more than one neuron today. So we have neurons, which are our basic building blocks. We have their dendrites on the left here in this diagram, and these are where information comes in, and it's integrated in the cell body, and then it comes down the axon in the form of action potentials, and then goes down to the axon terminals. Now really, last time we were just talking about the axon. We were talking about action potentials and how they move from one end of the axon to the other. We sort of ignored all the other parts of the neuron. Well, today we'll start talking about them a little bit more. So the question is, how do neurons communicate? So obviously, the brain transmits a lot of information from one cell to another. We have neural impulses going from our eyes from into, the, into the visual cortex of the brain. That gets processed so we can recognize objects, uh, maybe even recognize other people. Uh, and then that gets uh, used to make decisions, to create motor actions, to, to speak, to approach someone, to move away. Um, some sort of decision gets made, some sort of action gets implemented. So neurons are transferring information from, from one part of the brain to another. And how do they do that? Uh, well, they do it through junctions that are called synapses. Uh, so synapses are the meeting points between the parts of two different neurons. Uh, and synapses come in a variety of flavors. Um, so, for example, you can have on the left here, you can have axons that form synapses with the dendrites of another neuron. And that's the most common form of synapse, and it's the one we'll talk about today. Um, there are other forms as well in this diagram. Um, so the axon can connect directly to the cell body, also called the soma. Uh, the axon can connect to another axon. Or dendrites can connect to other dendrites. Pretty much any part of the neuron can connect to any other part of the neuron. But axons connected to dendrites is the most common kind of synapse and the one we'll focus on today. Uh, this is why I mentioned dendrites being the input area, axons being where the out output goes. Because more often than not, that's how information flows. From dendrites to axon, uh, down the axon to the dendrites of the next neuron. Technically, an, a, a neuron can often synapse on itself. So it connects, and its axon connects to its own dendrites, as well as to the dendrites of other neurons. And But th those all function more or less the same way. So we'll just talk about neuron 1 having axons that have synapses with the dendrites of neuron 2. So what do action potentials do? So we already know that neurons produce action potentials. We talked about that last time. And that's how information moves from the cell body uh, down the axon to the axon terminals. But what happens at that point? Uh, well, we'll get into the specific mechanisms for action potentials moving from one neuron to the next, uh, but what, what effect do they have bigger picture? Uh, so an action potential in what's called the presynaptic neuron, so if you have two neurons that connect, the one that has the information first, so the one that usually that has the, that, that's coming down the axon, 
Uh, that is the presynaptic neuron. It's before the synapse. And then information comes down to the end of the axon and then gets transferred to the dendrite of the next neuron. And the neuron of the dendrite is the postsynaptic neuron. It's after the synapse because the information flows in one particular direction. Uh, so in this diagram here, we have three exponentials coming down the axon of one neuron. And then that axon synapses. It can be a verb or a noun. Uh, it, it synapses on the dendrite of another neuron. And those exponentials come down, synapse, on, they, they, they get transmitted, and then in the cell body of neuron 2, if those add up, if, there's, if they add up to a big enough change in voltage, then neuron 2 will generate an exponential itself. Uh, and so this addition, the mechanism isn't really important for us, uh, but you can either have a bunch of exponentials coming down from one neuron, or you can have multiple exponentials in quick succession from multiple neurons. The idea is that the cell body of the receiving neuron integrates the information. It adds it all together, and if it meets a certain threshold, then neuron 2 basically says, okay, I'll fire an exponential now, now as well. Um, so that's what exponentials do, is they move down to the axon of a neuron, they get transmitted, and we'll talk about how that works in a minute, uh, and then once they get transmitted, all the exponentials coming into the receiving neuron get added together. And if they meet a certain criterion, if they reach a certain threshold, that is, then that receiving neuron will itself fire that exponential. Uh, so that's all well and good. To make things just a little more complicated, um, it's not always the case that an exponential coming down from neuron 1 makes an exponential in neuron 2 more likely. It can actually make it less likely. We call that inhibition. So an exponential from neuron 1 can excite neuron 2, make, that is, make it more likely that, that neuron 2 will fire an exponential itself, or it can inhibit neuron 2. That is, it can make it less likely that neuron 2 will fire an exponential. Uh, and we'll talk about how that works in a bit. Okay, so we've seen that neurons can affect one another through exponentials. Uh, and these can be excitatory or inhibitory. Uh, but the question is, how is that signal being sent? Uh, and this was actually a topic of quite a bit of debate uh, in the early 1900s. Uh, some individuals, some scientists thought that uh, electrical signals were transmitted directly from one neuron to the next. They were connected. Uh, they had a, a physical channel between them, and the electricity, the electrical impulse, just went through the junction between them. Uh, and that's how an exponential got initiated in the second neuron. Uh, the other school of thought was that there was a chemical signal that the first neuron, the exponential, would come down to the end of the axon, some chemical got released, uh, and then that chemical what was what was what was creating the reaction in neuron two. Um, so it turns out that both actually happen, but the chemical signaling is far more common in the nervous system. Uh, so we'll be talking about that, and that's really how drugs have their effect, is by uh, altering these chemical signals. And so that's what we'll talk about in this course. We're not going to really worry about uh, the, ele the direct electrical signaling. So this was discovered by a scientist named Otto Lowy. Uh, he actually got a Nobel Prize for his work. Uh, and, and what he did was he thought that the signal was chemical in nature. So he came up with a, a pretty clever experiment to test this idea. Uh, and what he did was he got a frog heart, put it in a jar, and that heart was still beating. Uh, and then what he did was he stimulated one of the nerves that goes into the heart. It's called the vagus nerve. Uh, and what happened was the heart started beating more slowly. He slowed down the heartbeat of the frog. Uh, and he thought, well, if this is a chemical, then the liquid that the frog heart is sitting in should now have this chemical floating around in it. So what he did was he then had a second heart that was beating, and he took just some of the liquid from the first heart that he stimulated the vagus nerve on uh, and transferred some of the liquid. And sure enough, that second heart slowed down as well. So it exhibited the same effect the first one did, but without any electrical or neural stimulation. So that was really the, the first real proof that there was some sort of chemical signal that was having an effect on, in this case, the heart, but in other neurons, other muscles, and so on. 
Uh, and so there's, if, it, if it had been electrical in nature, you can't contain electricity in an eyedropper, but you can contain a solution containing chemicals. Uh, and so transferring it chemically, transferring it through the liquid from one jar to another, was proof that it was a chemical signal that was being sent. And so that was a big breakthrough. Uh, and it opened up the, uh, the world of research on chemical transmission from, neuron, between, from one neuron to another. So the question is, what is a neurotransmitter? Lowy had discovered neurotransmitters, but what is a neurotransmitter? So we can define it with a couple of criteria. Uh, first, it's synthesized in the presynaptic neuron. The presynaptic neuron makes the neurotransmitter. Uh, and it's a chemical that gets released into the synaptic cleft. And really the synaptic cleft pretty specifically. So for example, potassium is not synthesized in the presynaptic neuron even though it's, it's contained in the neuron. And it's not released into the, in the cleft, it's released all over uh, in order to propagate the action potential. The neurotransmitters are released into the cleft as a signal to the other member of the synapse, to the postsynaptic neuron. Uh, and then, once that neurotransmitter is released, to qualify as a neurotransmitter, it has to have some effect on the postsynaptic neuron by way of what are called receptors. And we'll explain what a receptor is in a bit. For now, it's just a molecule that that neurotransmitter latches onto, and then that, that event, that latching onto the receptor, causes some event in the postsynaptic neuron. Uh, and then neurotransmitters are removed from the synaptic cleft by a certain mechanism. Now, these mechanisms can vary from cell to cell and from neurotransmitter to neurotransmitter. Um, sometimes there are enzymes that break them down in the synaptic cleft. Uh, sometimes they get sort of vacuumed back up into the presynaptic neuron and broken down after that. Uh, but the point is that they're released, they have some effect on the postsynaptic neuron, and they're very quickly taken up again or destroyed so that there's a, a very clear on-off signal, so to speak, whether the neurotransmitter is there or not. So how does this work? Well, we're going to start uh, with an overview. So an action potential leads to events in the presynaptic neuron, so at the end of the axon, the axon terminals. That's going to cause the release of the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. The neurotransmitter is then going to diffuse across the synapse and then activate receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. And then something happens in the postsynaptic neuron, whether ions come in or a complex chemical cascade begins, uh, we'll get into both those cases, but that's the basic sequence of events, is the action potential leads to the release of neurotransmitter. That neurotransmitter goes across the synapse, across the synaptic cleft, uh, and then activates receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. And we're going to break that process down. So we're going to start with the presynaptic side. So when an action potential comes down the axon, remember, an action potential is a moving depolarization of the axon. So we have all the sodium coming in, uh, and that depolarizes the inside of the neuron. So it brings that, the, the, the net charge inside the neuron closer to the charge outside. In fact, it, it goes past that point. Um, it depolarizes the neuron so much that for a little while, the inside of the neuron is actually more positive than the outside. But the point is that all the sodium is coming rushing into the neuron. What does that do? Well, as for the action potential itself, the way the action potential propagates, that is, moves down the axon, uh, is that it changes the voltage inside the neuron, and that opens up those sodium gates, those voltage-gated sodium channels. And so then that lets in more sodium, and that moves down the axon. Well, once it gets to the end, there's a similar mechanism, only now it's not sodium, it's calcium. So calcium is another, another one of our positive ions. There's a lot of calcium outside the neuron and almost none inside. So when all the sodium comes into the synaptic terminal, the, uh, the axon terminal, it again changes the voltage, just like it does in the axon. And these calcium channels are voltage gated and they're sensitive to that change. So when an action potential comes down to the axon terminal, it changes the voltage, opens those calcium channels, 
And because there's so much calcium outside and almost none inside, calcium comes rushing in, just like sodium does when sodium channels open up. So calcium comes rushing in, and that leads to binding of what are called synaptic vesicles. And these are these little circles that you see right here. So these are little sacs filled with neurotransmitter. And when calcium comes in, it lets those sacs bind to the outside membrane. And so they bind to the outside membrane, a little hole opens, and then all that neurotransmitter gets dumped into the synaptic cleft. So the synaptic vesicles release those neurotransmitter molecules. So that's what happens on the presynaptic side. Axial comes down the axon. It opens those voltage-gated calcium channels. Calcium comes rushing in, gets those synaptic vesicles to bind to the membrane, and then those synaptic vesicles release the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. Okay, so that's great. What happens after that? Well, first, the neurotransmitter should diffuse across the synaptic cleft. Remember, one of our forces for ions was diffusion. And it turns out diffusion applies to everything, that particles, atoms, molecules, uh, they all tend to move from where they're really concentrated to where they're not. And so if those synaptic vesicles have just released neurotransmitter, suddenly there's a lot of neurotransmitter on the presynaptic side and none on the postsynaptic side. So the neurotransmitter will diffuse from one side to the other. They'll diffuse toward the postsynaptic membrane, the membrane of the postsynaptic neuron. Well, once it gets there, it binds to receptors. And receptors are just molecules on the postsynaptic membrane that change in some way when a neurotransmitter binds to them. Uh, so, for example, here we have a diagram of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, which we'll, we'll talk more about in a minute. Uh, but acetylcholine goes across the synaptic cleft, binds to a receptor, and that receptor then changes shape. So normally it's a closed channel, just like a, a sodium channel is. But instead of being sensitive to voltage, it's sensitive to acetylcholine. So if acetylcholine, the neurotransmitter, binds to that receptor, that receptor now opens. And it lets in sodium. So again, we see sodium going through a channel. But this time the channel is open or closed depending on whether a neurotransmitter is there, not depending on the voltage across the membrane. So neurotransmitters bind to those receptors. And when those receptors open, in the case of the diagram here, they let in sodium, um, not all receptors do that. Now, they're not all ion channels. Sometimes they're molecules that trigger a whole set uh, of chemical cascades, a set of chemical reactions that have wider ranging and longer term effects. And that's the subject of this slide. So we have what are called ionotropic receptors, which are shown here on the left, and metabotropic receptors. And as the, the first one's name suggests, ionotropic receptors let in ions. They're ion channels, just like sodium channels, potassium channels, and now we've just talked about calcium channels. These are all molecules that, have, that are basically little tunnels through the membrane. And they open up, and now, Sodium can come in, for example. So sodium goes from where it's really common, outside the neuron, to where it's less common inside, and depolarizes the neuron. So this is how we can start an action potential. We have a neurotransmitter binding to a receptor. That receptor opens and now lets in a bunch of sodium. So that's how we can start an action potential, uh, is by letting in that sodium and depolarizing the neuron. And from there, the action potential proceeds in the normal way uh, down the dendrite, through the cell body, down the axon. Um, once it gets started, it, it, it's a, uh, a positive feedback loop. Sodium comes in, depolarizes nearby areas of the neuron, causes sodium channels there to open, sodium comes in there, again, the charge propagates, and so on. But, but this is how it gets started, is by letting in sodium ions uh, due to the presence of the neurotransmitter. Uh, so the thing about ionotropic receptors is they're very fast. We've already seen how fast an action potential is, that especially for a myelinated axon, you're talking about an impulse that can travel 150 meters per second. 
So we know how fast these ion channels can be. We can depolarize a neuron very quickly. Uh, the metabotropic receptors are different. So when a, when a neurotransmitter binds to them, uh, they undergo some kind of change. That always has to take place. If it doesn't do anything, then it's not really synaptic transmission because you can't transmit anything. Uh, but these metabotropic receptors change shape in some way, and that changes the shape of some other molecule, that molecule interacts with another one, and so on. So it causes this chain of events. Uh, and this chain of events takes a little bit longer, so metabotrop metabotropic receptors are slower, but they have these longer-term effects. They can also open up ion channels nearby, as shown in this diagram over here. We see neurotransmitter binding to this receptor. That receptor activates this molecule. This one happens to be called the G protein. That's not important for us. Uh, but that G protein can then, in turn, open up ion channels. So it can have immediate effects. They just take a little bit longer. But that G protein can then go on and affect things like transcription in the nucleus of the cell. So it can start making different kinds of proteins. It can even make different kinds of receptors. So if a receptor gets activated, it can cause more receptors of that type to be created and put out on the membrane. So that membrane, that area of the membrane, then becomes more sensitive to that neurotransmitter. That neurotransmitter can cause more of its own receptor to be put out of the membrane. And this is one of the things that drugs can do. Uh, and this is how you get things like sensitivity and tolerance, uh, is that over time, you can keep on putting more and more of these receptors out of the membrane so you become more sensitive to the substance. Uh, or it can take away more and more uh, of those receptors. So you require relatively higher amounts of the substance to get the same level of activation. Uh, and that's what metabotropic receptors do, is they create these long-term effects, or these long-term changes in how the cell functions. Uh, so some of the most common neurotransmitters. Uh, first is glutamate. It is the most common neurotransmitter. Uh, and it's, it's excitatory. Uh, so if you have a synapse that is glutamatergic, that is, the presynaptic neuron releases glutamate into the synaptic cleft, uh, that's going to excite the postsynaptic neuron. It's going to depolarize the neuron. It's going to make it more likely to fire an action potential. And if you've heard the term glutamate, Oftentimes, people, people have heard this word uh, because of MSG, or monosodium glutamate, which is one of the main components in things like soy sauce. Um, so this is something that enhances flavor. Sodium does, but so does glutamate, because it's, it's a neurotransmitter, and there are glutamate receptors in your mouth. Um, and so those pick up glutamate, uh, and again, you have this excitatory reaction. But glutamate is also a neurotransmitter in the brain. And again, it's primarily involved in excitation. You also have what's called gamma aminobutyric acid, which is also, also known just as GABA. Uh, and it's actually the opposite. It's the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter. Now, it's not as common as glutamate, but there are a whole lot of GABAergic, that is GABA-producing, neurons in the brain. And they're inhibitory. If the presynaptic neuron releases GABA, into a synapse, it makes the postsynaptic neuron less likely to fire. How does it do that? Uh, well, we talked last lecture about the different ions that are present around the neuron. One of them is chloride. Now, it's a negative ion. We haven't really talked about it much, but it's important here because that's how a neuron gets inhibited. So when glutamate, for example, uh, binds to a receptor, that receptor opens, lets in sodium. And as, as we know, sodium depolarizes a neuron, and, and can, in sufficient quantities, initiate an action potential. Now think about chloride. Chloride is oppositely charged, but there's still a lot of it outside the neuron. So if you let in chloride, now you're hyperpolarizing the neuron. That is, you're making it more negative. So letting in sodium makes it more positive, makes an action potential more likely. Letting in chloride hyperpolarizes the neuron, makes it more negative than it was already and makes an action potential less likely. So that's how a neuron gets inhibited, is GABA diffuse, is released by the presynaptic neuron, diffuses across the synaptic cleft, latches onto receptors on the postsynaptic side, and those receptors let in chloride that makes an action potential less likely.
Now, of course, a neuron is always adding together all its inputs. So if you have a little bit of GABA inhibiting a neuron, but a lot of glutamate exciting it, well, that's going to be a net excitatory effect. And the neuron will probably fire an action potential. So it's always a combination of all the inputs the neuron is getting. So those are the two main neurotransmitters, and they're found throughout the brain. Okay, so we have glutamate and we have GABA, and those are the primary neurotransmitters in the brain. They're certainly the most common, uh, but they're not the only neurotransmitters. And so there are several other ones that we'll talk about. Uh, and these, these neurotransmitters uh, usually originate in structures in the midbrain. We'll talk about what that means next time. Uh, but it's sort of a central portion of the lower brain. Uh, and so you have these cell bodies, and then they send their axons throughout larger portions of the brain. So they can affect a lot of the brain at once, but there's really relatively few of these neurons. And what these things do is they act as what are called neuromodulators. That is to say that they don't, again, comprise much of the total activity in the brain, but they alter the intensity of activity in one place or another. Uh, and so they, they tend to affect the activity in nearby synapses. Uh, so you have synapses that are sensitive, not just to the, to the neurotransmitters glutamate or GABA, uh, but to these other neuromodulators, these other neurotransmitters. And that can affect one way or the other uh, how active a synapse is. So what are some of these other neurotransmitters, these neuromodulators? Uh, well, one is dopamine, and you've probably heard of dopamine. Uh, dopamine is important for motor control. Uh, it's also important for decision making. Uh, so if you've heard of Parkinson's disease, and I imagine most, if not all of us have, uh, Parkinson's disease uh, is a difficulty one of the, the main symptoms is a difficulty in controlling motor output. Um, so we have the Parkinson's patients have a difficulty in, hip, in, in initiating movement. The treatment, primarily for, do, for Parkinson's, is with L-DOPA, which is a sort of synthetic precursor to dopamine. So you're, you're bumping up the dopamine levels for the Parkinson's patient because the cells that normally produce dopamine uh, have died. And so you're supplementing the person's dopamine supply. Uh, it's also heavily implicated in reward processing, and we'll see it come up again and again in our discussion of various drugs. Uh, now, originally it was thought the dopamine was sort of the reward neurotransmitter, that anytime something was rewarding, that you'd see dopamine. And as with most things in science, that turned out to be a little simplistic. Um, so what it, it does seem certainly to be involved in reward processing, and it does... Uh, get released when rewarding events happen, but it also gets released for things like surprising events. And I'm not going to detail this experiment shown in the diagram on the right, uh, but where you see the uh, this R here, uh, that's where a reward has occurred. And so you see this increase in dopaminergic firing represented by these dots to the right, uh, and also added up up top here is this little hill you see. Uh, so that indicates relatively more firings compared to the relatively few dots you see before it. Uh, but it turns out it's not just the reward. If I pair a light or a sound or something that isn't rewarding uh, with the reward, so I, I see a light and then five seconds later I get a reward, then eventually my dopamine neurons will fire in response to the light because the light predicts the reward. So the, the light itself isn't rewarding. So the dopamine neurons can't be responding to reward because there isn't anything rewarding yet. What they seem to be responding to is the prediction of reward. And so dopamine is also heavily implicated in the, the process of learning. And learning is just a way of saying that neurons change their structure or their firing pattern uh, through experience. And so dopamine encodes these differences from what between what the brain is predicting what actually happens, and that's a signal that we have something to learn about. So dopamine is important for motor control, uh, for reward processing, and for learning. And as we'll see later, uh, addiction has sometimes been framed as a learning problem. Uh, you also have the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, and this is often described as the cholinergic system. 
Uh, and, and acetylcholine is involved in muscular function. So it's the neurotransmitter that activates your muscles. Once those nerve impulses uh, travel down to your, to, your, uh, to your muscles, acetylcholine gets released. That causes your muscles to contract. Uh, it also seems to be involved in memory function. Uh, so uh, patients with Alzheimer's are often prescribed uh, drugs that increase the effectiveness of acetylcholine. And that seems to help with memory retention and memory formation. Another neurotransmitter that's important is serotonin. And we've probably heard of this one. This is one of the more famous ones. Uh, it's also known as 5-HT. That's just the abbreviation of its chemical name. Uh, but it's involved in things like sleep. But it, it's heavily involved in mood and anxiety. Uh, and so a lot of antidepressants work on the serotonin system. Uh, now, the mechanisms by which it regulates mood aren't entirely understood. But we know that certain drugs, antidepressants, uh, or at least moderately effective uh, in alleviating depression, and they, they have an effect on the serotonin system. And we'll get into how exactly they work uh, when we get to antidepressants. Uh, but for example, antidepressants like Prozac or Paxil uh, both work in conjunction with the serotonin system to alter the person's mood. Uh, you also have noradrenaline which is also known as norepinephrine. Uh, in fact, in this class, we will more commonly refer to it as norepinephrine. Uh, adrenaline and epinephrine, as we'll see, are the same thing. Uh, they were discovered at, at different places and originally were thought to be two different chemicals. Then later it was found out they're the same thing, uh, but the two different names were already being commonly used. Uh, so norepinephrine is involved in things like alertness and mood. So when something surprising happens, you get norepinephrine release. And that raises your arousal level uh, and changes things like uh, how sensitive you are to visual stimuli, uh, does things like shut down your digestive processes. Uh, it's involved in what's called the, the fight or flight reaction. Uh, and we'll get into that next week. Uh, but again, it's involved in arousal, alertness, and also to a certain degree mood. Uh, some antidepressants work on both serotonin uh, and the norepinephrine systems. Well, then you have regular adrenaline, otherwise known as epinephrine. Uh, and again, we've heard of adrenaline. It's something that, that again, it is involved in arousal, uh, alertness, memory uh, as well. Um, so this is a, uh, a chemical that it sort of increases your energy level, uh, gets you ready for motor activity. Uh, so it's present in the brain. It's also present throughout the body. And then finally, the, the last category I'll talk about today uh, is endorphins. Uh, and this word comes from a combination of uh, endogenous and morphine. Uh, so, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, we knew about morphine before we understood all the neurotransmitters in the body. So people have been using uh, opiates for centuries, if not millennia. Uh, and so it was later discovered that there's a chemical in the brain, in the body, that acts like morphine does. Its chemical structure is very similar. Uh, so it turns out, of course, that we the naming convention in terms of a history is sort of reversed. Um, the reason that morphine works is because we have these chemicals in the body that work like morphine. It's not the other way around. Um, but morphine was discovered first, so endorphins are an endogenous form of morphine. So what do these do? Well, these alter pain perception. So these reduce the perception of pain uh, and painful stimuli. Uh, and so these are things get, that get released, particularly during physical activity, and diminish our response to pain. Uh, briefly, I'll go over the life cycle of a neurotransmitter, just a couple things about how they get produced. Um, so I, I've already touched on this a little bit with the dopamine story in Parkinson's. Uh, neurotransmitters are synthesized from what are called precursors, which are just the building blocks of the neurotransmitter. Uh, and so you have to have, for example, tyrosine to eventually produce neurotransmitters like dopamine. Uh, of course, you can, you can take L-DOPA, which is one of the intermediate chemicals, and, and artificially raise your dopamine levels. Uh, but your body also produces dopamine naturally from tyrosine. Uh, also, some neurotransmitters are made from others. You have to make dopamine uh, in order to have norepinephrine. So norepinephrine is derived 
from dopamine. And so you can fit these neurotransmitters, uh, several of them uh, fall into little classes. Uh, you have things called catecholamines, which we're not going to go into. Um, but these are classes of chemically similar neurotransmitters. And these neurotransmitters are often just small variations on the chemical structure of related neurotransmitters. And uh, this is from your book. So how do things get synthesized? Uh, and we talk about neurotransmitters being synthesized in the presynaptic neuron. Well, what does that mean? It means that the presynaptic neuron has enzymes that can create the, uh, the, the neurotransmitter, shown here on the left. Uh, and so the precursor molecules fit together on the enzyme, and the enzyme combines them. So an enzyme is really just a molecule that makes a chemical reaction more likely. So the precursor molecules could, in theory, just float around until they meet each other and create the neurotransmitters. But you wouldn't get very much neurotransmitter that way, and you wouldn't get it very quickly. The enzyme really speeds up the process, facilitates the creation uh, of neurotransmitter. Now, the opposite is a, a metabolic enzyme. So this is something that breaks down neurotransmitter. And these are things you can find in the synaptic cleft for certain neurotransmitters, because, again, the idea of neurotransmitter is that you release it quickly, and you break it down quickly, so you have this very responsive signal to whether the presynaptic neuron is firing or not. Uh, so you have these metabolic enzymes that the neurotransmitter fits onto, and it breaks them apart. So that's how a neurotransmitter is created and broken down, and both those processes are important for synaptic transmission. Okay, so that is how neurons talk to one another. Uh, so next time, We'll talk, the, we'll talk about the brain in a larger scale, look at the larger structure of the brain. Uh, we'll talk about the divisions of the nervous system, and there are various ways of breaking down the nervous system into structural or functional parts. Um, and this will give us sort of a, a roadmap for discussing other drugs uh, later in the course. We'll talk about which systems a drug affects, how it affects it. Uh, we'll also talk about some of the techniques we use to look at the brain and brain activity. We'll talk about structural uh, and functional imaging. Uh, and that's it for this week's lecture content. Uh, I will see you all next week, and don't, don't forget to participate in discussion.